and welcome to today's lecture on uh, beauty and death. Um, this one we're going to go back just a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about how we get to clothing that is not necessarily the best choice for us. Um, as a disclaimer, as we've talked about before, um, we do not judge people's personal choices. Um, people make clothing choices for a, an innumerable amount of reasons, uh, societal, personal, uh, cultural choices. We are not here to make a judgment call. We are merely here to look at it through the lens of history. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about what clothing is. So clothing is really anything that alters or covers the human body. Um, and this is all under the umbrella of dress. Um, this can include things like clothing, shoes, shirts, pants, under things, uh, underpinnings that change the human shape like corsets and bras. Uh, it can also include um, hair is under this umbrella of dress. Uh, support clothing is under this umbrella of dress. Um, we also include jewelry under this umbrella, uh, body modifications, uh, things like tattoos, scarification, piercings, or medical altera alterations or coverings. Um, and we see a couple of examples here. Um, you know, we see this, this interesting group of uh, what we call Congo dandies in this uh, in this uh, corner here, uh, that the idea of dressing fine, the idea of dressing well, overcomes um, the need for other uh, other parts of human sustenance sometimes. Um, we see uh, clothing that is protective. So this is someone who is a protester. So they're wearing things that cover their face. Also, that shows their allegiance. Um, we also it also goes as extreme as uh, runway clothing, um, which is a uh, high end fashion haute couture, uh, which is not necessarily clothing that we'll see on the street, but you think of them more as walking art pieces. So we can go as far as saying uh, clothing like um, Alexander McQueen's dresses are dress as well as something as simple as the socks with a hole in the heel that I pull on in the morning. Sometimes they match, sometimes they don't, but it's still under that auspices of dress. And anytime we make choice to dress a certain way, that is our choice. It is a reflection of the interior life. Uh, any piece of clothing or dress that we endeavor uh, that we engage in is part of that interior life. Even when you think you're not making a choice, you are still making a choice. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about as relates to beauty and death um, is the function of clothing. So this idea of practical versus expressive. So what we have to wear versus how we wear it. So a, a great example of this is shown in the two images here, that there is a definite function in, for scrubs, right? For any of you who, who work in the medical field or, or are uh, interns or eventually will work in the medical field or have family that work in the medical field, there are distinct reasons why people wear scrubs. They're easy to clean. They're made of cotton. Cotton is a great um, anti, relatively antibacterial, um, uh, antimicrobial element baked into the, to what cotton is. Um, you can process uh, scrubs at a very high heat and it won't affect the cotton. So you can, um, you can sterilize them as much as you can sterilize any piece of clothing. Um, they clean really well. So if you get a blood or other effusia on it, um, it will get rid of that. Uh, you can wash that out fairly well. Um, and it's they're super duper sturdy. But you'll notice in the picture here on the left that we have three different colors of scrubs. So we have a green one, we have a blue one, and then we have kind of blue ones. You'll also notice that they don't fit very well, that they don't fit anybody very well. Um, and that's sort of the, the weirdness of scrubs is that they're just this sort of neutral sack 
that is there to protect the wearer and to have they're as neutral as possible. Um, although I did have one student one time whose mother was a nurse that said that um, the clothing in uh, clothing is scrubs are sometimes color coded in hospitals so that people can identify groups. So nurses might wear one color of scrub, scrubs, surgeons might wear a different color of scrubs. Uh, I also just read an article that there's a reason why in operating theaters that a lot of uh, everybody wears green scrubs. Uh, it's because of eye fatigue. So if you stare at the way our rods and cones work, that if you stare at something that's red, our cones see for color. Uh, our cones fire red, fire the signal for our brain to perceive red. And if you look at something that's red, like innards, that, that red will fire, 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 and then we get fatigued. So they have scrubs that are green that are opposite of the color wheel of red so that it allows our eyes to rest from shooting, uh, from having that um, over firing of the red cone, uh, which I found super fascinating. So it's very practical. Scrubs are very, very practical. But what happens when you go to the vet and the vet tech is wearing scrubs with dogs on them? Or you go to a peds ward, a pediatric ward, and the scrubs are uh, the, the 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 nurse is wearing scrubs with Iron Man on them, or with Marvel characters on them, or with town puppies on them, or with Paw Patrol on them, um, or even the one that we see here that the scrub is a little more tailored um, and has a decorative element. Does this scrub on the right work the same as the other scrubs? Absolutely. It does the exact same function. It can be cleaned easily. It is antimicrobial a little bit, um, but it has that expressive element. So this woman here has to wear scrubs in her job, but we see here that she is wearing it decoratively as well. So it's showing off her interior life. Um, all clothing is expressive. All clothing has a narrative to it. But not all clothing is practical. Um, there is never just one reason why people wear a piece of clothing. Um, we are decorative people. We cannot help but decorate. It's our nature. We have been decorating ourselves, our spaces, our clothing for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Um, it is just how we tell the world who we are how we tell other people how, who we are, how we link to other groups. And that sort of important life force, the life affirming force of clothing is deep. Um, and sometimes it overrides our, uh, our, uh, our self-preservation. Um, I went to school at West Virginia University in Morgantown, West Virginia. I went to graduate school there. And um, I was going to the library, I think it was February. And I was headed to the library and there was this young woman walking to the library as well. It was early Saturday. I think she was going to the library because it was early Saturday morning. And she was, it was pretty cold out. So she was wearing Ugg boots. She was wearing, she had a park on. She had like a fur, uh, a fur lined jacket on and her hair was done. And she was, um, she was perfectly dressed, except she was wearing short shorts. Um, so that need to show off herself, that need for expression trumped the need for warm knees. Um, so this is this is something that we're going to be looking at uh, a bit in this in this lecture is how expressiveness sometimes trumps self-preservation. Um, so there are three different types of practice. We can categorize practical clothing into three different areas. So it's protection, information, and usefulness. Now, none of this stuff is ever just one thing. Um, it, it often crosses over. Um, so protection. So this is clothing that helps enhances our survivability um, and uh, hence our human made extensions of the body's protective resources. Um, so one of the first ways that we wear clothing, uh, and it was cold, pretty dang cold recently. Um, so we wear clothing to protect us from the elements, from the cold. So we'll wear jackets and boots and woolly socks. And when we're out ice fishing for sturgeon, we'll wear the, 
the hats with ear flaps on them and anything we can do to keep ourselves warmer. Um, we can also have clothing that protects us from uh, from the the sun, from the heat, as we see in this gentleman on this side. You know, he's at the beach, but he has covered every almost every bit of exposed skin so that he does not suffer a sunburn or uh, from the UV rays and and skin cancer. Um, now, when we talk about weather conditions and having to wear clothing to protect ourselves, it's probably not as important as we once thought. Um, we've uh, uh, anthropologists have found groups uh, around the world that uh, I think it was in the Andes Mountains they found they came across a cultural group that really, in very cold, cold temperatures, didn't wear much more than decorate decorative clothing. Um, they were not wrapping up for the frigid temperatures of the high Andes. Um, so it's it's often about our adaptability, and human beings are wonderfully adaptive. Um, we are able to, um, for those of you who are who live in Wisconsin, you know we we wrap up for January and February, but the second that the weather is above forty degrees, you're going to find a student in shorts. You're going to find students running out without jackets on. Um, if that happened in Florida, if that happened in Miami, that it was 40 degrees, everyone would be piled in with sweaters. Um, and it's all just about our adaptability. Um, we also have protection from critters and nature's uh, nature. So uh, wearing shoes, uh, having netting to protect us from uh, from mosquitoes, from bees. Um, we'll put sprays and scents on ourselves to warn off insects. Um, we'll also wear specialty clothing like uh, like this net here, or uh, think uh, beekeeper's gear that protects themselves from, from critters. Um, we also see uh, protection from dangerous or hazardous conditions. Um, these can be occupational, um, so something like a, a, fire, uh, a fire personnel's gear the 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 clothing that protects them from high heat and dangerous conditions is is clothing that is necessary um you know in deep sea diving or or underwater swimming you know we see people wearing wetsuits and flippers and then that breather the rebreather with the oxygen tank that the survivability underwater and in a fire and in other hazardous uh, other, other hazardous places is very, very low unless you have specific clothing that protects you from it. Um, and then this idea of personal PPE, personal protection equipment. Um, and I always tell my students that um, anytime you're working with hazardous chemicals or hazardous conditions like sawdust and stuff, your, uh, your safety is your concern. The, the company might not have your best interest at heart. Um, so it is your job to protect yourself. So ask for a dust mask, ask for goggles, wear a hard hat, wear gloves. Dear God, if you're ever staining anything with um, paint stain, wear gloves because that stuff can hurt you. Um, steel toed shoes, non slip shoes, anything like that, you must be aware of your own safety. Um, in extreme circumstances like underwater, like in a fire, um, we could not survive without specialty clothing. So think about what is where is one place in the world that there is no chance of survival without person personal equipment in this world or out of this world. And that's in outer space. No matter what the Martian tells us, uh, we probably could not survive um, nanoseconds without personal protective equipment. But you'll notice that even though this equipment, every piece of this equipment is designed to enhance the survivability for the person in the suit. There is also decorative elements. Could this suit work without these patches, without name tags, without the American flag? Absolutely. It can function 100%. But human beings can't help but decorate. So that is what we do. We put patches and name tags and, and things like that all over it because that's who we are. We have to show the world that we are an astronaut, plus we are other things. Um, so we see that we also see something that um, protects, and our protection can be really, really simple. Um, like the Totika, 
Um, this is the penis gourd that is worn by native groups in New Guinea. Um, and, you know, it is merely there to protect the soft bits. What do you absolutely have to protect? And it's usually, when it comes down to it, it's going to protect the things that are most tender. So the bottoms of our feet, our, our genitals, our faces, our eyes are the things that get protected the most. Now, uh, whenever uh, anthropologists first met this, the, these groups, they thought that the, the, the gourd um, represented the size of you know, the, the soft bit. Um, it is not true. Uh, the gourd is, uh, it is linked to uh, social groups. So the size and type and color of the gourd is linked for, linked to your, um, your social group, your, your clan, your, your family tribe, or um, it is linked and it's linked to protection. Um, you also have protection from hostile spirits, from bad luck, from the unseen world, uh, from in, uh, infertil infertility, we'll also wear something that protects us uh, spiritually. So things like a cross, things like a rosary, um, the hamsa, which we see here in the middle. Um, you know, we would uh, uh, fetishes, little uh, dolls and uh, kuchinas that uh, that protect us, that make us feel better, that act, sometimes we see them as acting as intermediaries between us and the unseen world allowing us to communicate with the unseen world in, in ways better than speech. Um, uh, this one is the, uh, a Thai tradition of the yak, uh, sak yang, um, which is uh, tattooing uh, religious inscriptions on the body to protect the bearer from evil. Um, sometimes we'll see tattoos that do that um, in Western cultures as well, or in um, in uh, uh, Russian cultures that uh, if we take a look at sort of Russian prison tattoos sometimes that the, the, the information that is tattooed on the body is uh, unspoken, nonverbal communication that might protect the bearer of the tattoo. Um, clothing also represents information. Um, this can be occupational or craft specific uniform, uh, craft specific clothing like uniforms so if you go into target you can tell who is a target worker because of their red shirt their khaki pants and their name tag um i have any number of times i have gone into target because i have that sort of helpful face and people mistake me for a target worker or someone that is helpful uh, i am helpful but i don't work at target so i can't help you um uh, we also see uh, clothing that is informational, like uniforms, like very formal uniforms. Um, this dude is a Coast Guard person, but that is as far as I know. Um, often with uh, informational clothing that is group specific. So, for example, like the armed forces or um, or groups, uh, insular groups like uh, this picture of a motorcycle club, that the information that is given on these pieces of clothing are known only to initiates. Um, and that is some sometimes wonderful and terrible at the same time that only if you belong to the group can you dissect, can you interpret what this uniform is, this informational clothing is saying. Um, we also wear clothing because they're useful. So um, these are extensions of our body that make our lives easier, better, more useful. So Google or uh, Apple watches or our cell phone or a backpack or a briefcase or, or a purse that carries our dog or even eyeglasses. These extend usefulness to us and it can be any number of things. Um, so what happens when all of this clothing that we're relying on to protect us doesn't do it, doesn't do it well? Um, when so, what happens when the need for self-expression um, trumps self-preservation, whether we know it or not? Um, when societal pressures force people to counter their best interests, um, that's when we get to this place where uh, where dress, where everything that is involved in clothing in dress um, becomes can become dangerous. Um, and again, I'm going to remind you that we're not judging, but we are merely reporting. So what we're going to cover today 
is mechanical alterations to the human form, um, uh, chemical additives, and other hazards. And the last one is a bit of clothing silliness, which is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about mechanical alterations. Um, this is using an apparatus or a series of apparati that um, uh, that alter our silhouette, that alter our shape, um, to be, appear taller, to appear more willowy, to have better legs, to appear thinner, um, and to become more conventionally attractive. Um, this has existed since the beginning of human beings. All of this stuff has existed since the beginning of humans. Um, it is something that is that is part of the human condition. Um, and this, a lot of these mechanical alterations are very much dictated by the, the preoccupation of culture. So what does society claim is beautiful? What does society claim is attractive or, um, or proper? I mean, that is a big one, uh, the idea of properness. Um, so one of the first ones and one of the most well-known mechanical apparatus to change the human form um, is the corset. This is a mechanical means of shaping the torso. Um, and this has changed. I mean, corsets have been around since the Renaissance and before, um, but it has changed a lot throughout the ages because um, each society, each culture, each era has a different ideal of beauty. Um, so, for example, this is Queen Elizabeth in the, the Elizabethan Renaissance, and the, the corset style is very long and almost funnel-like into this wheel farthingale that we're looking at here. Um, this is the one that is kind of what we, when we think about corsets, that sort of cinching in of the waist. Um, and we think it's gone today. No, people still wear corsets today. They, they wear corsets to help them. Um, stand upright. Um, some people wear corsets for medical reasons, corsets, trusses, girdles for medical reasons to help them, um, help them strengthen their musculoskeletal system. Um, some people wear corsets or um, stomachers to make themselves more attractive. Um, some people wear uh, corsets or stomachers or uh, do waist training that's um, uh, slowly over time shrinking the circumference of your waist for weight, uh, for lifting weights as well. Um, so this is the this is the the corset that we are most familiar with, one that sort of comes into the where the soft bits exist and pulls in here where it can be pulled in, and then it is is um, wider at the hips and at the bust. Um, and this is an example of a 17th century steel corset. Um, I heard tell that this was a myth that people didn't really wear it, but some of the other sources I found said that, yeah, there was a couple of people in France that actually wore uh, steel corsets. Um, could you imagine wearing that in Wisconsin in February? You would freeze bits of you off. Um, so these are kind of, these are the 19th century corsets that are sort of, when we think about a corset that are the most, um, the, the ones that are brought to mind. Um, so the way a corset is constructed is that it, it's from, um, there are different slices of fabric that are kind of quilted, as you see here, these, these pieces of um, seams here, these, these ribs here are, are quilts, and then they have these big pieces here. And this is where we get the term boning. So this, each of these um, long channels have a piece of bone in them. Uh, modern corsets are made from uh, spiral steel wires um, because they're really flexible and they hold shape really well. You also have plastic is common today. Um, for those of you who wear bras, anytime you have that plastic on the side, that's considered boning. Um, back in the day, the reason they're called boning is because they used to be made of whalebone. Um, in the front of a corset is this is called a busk. These are the kind of hook and eyes that you that uh, allow you to attach it in the front. And then in the back is a lacing. So we can see that in the image here. Um, and whenever you tie a corset, for those of you who have never worn one but want one someday, um, you never 
uh, lace a corset from the bottom up or from the top down. You lace from the top to center and the bottom to center because this is where you want the tightness. So this is where you put the knot. Um, and so these are some of the uh, 17th century corsets. Um, this is the wasp waist style corset, um, which cinches in in the middle. So if you think, if you remember, um, uh, if you remember uh, Gone with the Wind, uh, Scarlett O'Hara, she needed that teeny tiny little 18 inch waist or something, something really small. Um, that's what this type of corset was. So this is 17th and eight, uh, 18th and 19th century style corset. Um, so one of the ways that we see corsets, this is the S curve, um, which is popularized at the end of the, during the Belle Epoch, during the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Um, and what we see in the S curve is a bust, tiny waist, and a backside. So we're looking at creating this sort of um, very, what at the time they believe was very sensuous S-curve. So we see that in this, in this woman here, this is a Gibson girl. Um, and we see how these corsets sort of work. And you can see in the, uh, in the photograph here what happens, how it's laced. Um, so this is creating that S-curve um, and this one as well. But you, you'll notice that the, the, the tightening, you can't really tighten your hips because of all the bone in there. You can't really tighten your, um, your ribs because of all the bone in there. So if you're going to tighten something, it's going to be in this soft bit here. And you'll, uh, you'll notice in these two images that the corset itself lends itself to this S curve. So um, depending on the style that you're looking for, the corset will give you the shape that you want. So if it's a, if it's an Edwardian or if it's a, a, a Renaissance funnel shape, it's going to give you that shape. If it's an S curve, we have another type of corset coming up here as well. Um, in a set, another look as well. Um, the corset is going to mechanically alter your shape to fit that mold. Um, and there's a lot of, there was a lot of railing against corsets um, in the media. Um, so have you made it around? How small is somebody else's waist? <gasps> she's at, she's at 19 and a half. Get me down to 19. Let's get it smaller. Um, so it's this, this is a punch. I believe this is a punch magazine um, a cartoon. And we also see in this, in this image here, about how it takes three people to tighten this corset down to its its essential smallness, as small as it can go. So you hang on to the bedpost and let them yank away. Um, so what do corsets do to the body, as we see in this image here? Uh, it constricts the lungs. So uh, everybody put their hands on their stomach and breathe in and then breathe out. Um, the muscle that what you feel moving in there is your diaphragm. Um, and the diaphragm is the muscle that helps draw your lungs in and out. Um, if you have a corset on, your a diaphragm cannot expand your uh, chest cavity as far as you, you probably want it to be to get a full breath. So if you constrict the lungs, often you can't get a full breath. And if you're out of breath, that deprives you of oxygen, allows you to faint. And lo and behold, we invent the fainting couch. Um, so this is one of the one of the things that happens whenever you wear a corset. Um, indigestion, acid reflux, it constricts the stomach. So sometimes the stomach acids will will bubble up, um, and then you don't want to eat because we expand when we eat. So we don't want to eat because we have that constriction. Um, muscle atrophy and lower back pain. So if you're using this mechanical means to support yourself, and you loosen it you'll lose some of that support and your muscles might not do the job as well and you might have back pain. Um, another one is uh, apocryphal is miscarriages and other pregnancy problems that the constriction of the waist constricts the womb and might cause a miscarriage. Now, as a, as a note, uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these um, claims came at a time during the dress reform, uh, during a time when um, certain people were, were raging against fashion and they wanted women to stop wearing corsets. So some of these claims are hyperbolic. Are corsets 
So the question becomes, are corsets, are, are corsets as bad as people say they are, as history says they are? Well, not really. Um, I myself have worn corsets before um, because I was in a play and the character wore a corset, so I wore a corset. They're kind of comfy, actually, because they sort of make you sit upright. They hold your chest in a nice place. Um, they, they help support your back. Would I wear one every day? Absolutely not. It's bad enough wearing a bra every day. Um, but it's the corset is not, I mean, I, I also, the, the costumer did not force us to constrict, constrict ourselves down to tiny corset size. Um, I don't think I could do that because I am a, a round woman. Um, but, you know, they're not generally not as bad uh, as history has made them out to be. Am I glad they're gone? Absolutely. But were they as bad? Not really. Um, one of the other uh, weird corseting that happened that was in fashion for a very short amount of time was the Grecian bend. Um, so this was a combo of different pieces of clothing that was uh, that constricted women's steps and how they move. Um, so this was a combination of a bustle, and a bustle is a, a, a piece of wire or a basket work that sits on the posterior and allows your butt to stick out. Uh, panniers, which are side, there are two basket works on the side, so you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of mass on your hips and on your butt. A corset that constricts your waist, and high-heeled shoes. So you couldn't take long steps; you had to take teeny tiny steps. Um, you couldn't walk out, um, and you it was, you know, uncomfortable. Fortunately, it did not last very long, but. Um, they made songs about it, so it lasted long enough to be noticed. Um, another mechanical means for uh, for clothing death was the detachable stiff collar. Um, in the past, in the uh, 19th century, collars were detachable because people didn't have a ton of shirts, so collars were where you got sweaty, so they had detachable collars so you can have a clean collar on. Um, and so this was a type of a stiff collar that was called the Vatermutter, the father killer. Um, because it was so stiff, um, generally these sorts of collars were a lot lower and not up to your, uh, not up to your chin, not up to your jawline. Um, they were a lot lower, so it allowed for freedom of movement. Um, but because these types of collars were so stiff, um, if you fell asleep, if you looked down a lot, if you tilted your head too much, um, you could do yourself an injury, um, such as cutting off blood supply to your brain, cutting off your carotid artery. Um, men could also suffocate if they drank too much and fell asleep and leaned forward, leaned their head forward. They could cut off their windpipe. Um, they could uh, constrict their windpipe and um, suffocate. Um, again. Maybe apocryphal, but I, I read some accounts that this would happen. These didn't last very long. They were a very small part of clothing history, a deadly clothing history. Um, another one that is a mechanical uh, something, a piece of clothing that it mechanically can harm us is the long scarf. Um, this was made very popular with uh, Doctor Who. So it was long scarf syndrome. So people who wore long scarves could get them stuck and uh, uh, choke themselves, hurt their ligaments. They would get uh, wrapped around car wheels, um, ski lifts that happened a lot because people wore them while skiing, um, snowmobile em engines, anything that because they're, you know, this scarf is 10 feet long, it goes wherever it goes and it is a danger. Um, so we see, um, we see Dr. Who over here with his long scarf that was very, very popular and, uh, a more modern version of that. Um, somebody who died from long scarf syndrome was uh, the dancer Isadora Duncan. She of the many scarves, that was kind of her trademark with the long flowy scarves. And one of her scarves got caught in a, a car wheel and, and strangled her to death. Um, so, uh, so that is another mechanical means. Um, so let's talk about feet. Let's talk about, let's go from the head and the torso down to the feet. 
So one of the uh, mechanical means of changing our shape uh, is uh, earliest is the, the chopines. Um, these are kind of tall shoes uh, that were worn in the 17th century. You saw them in France, uh, England, and in Italy. Um, and the way they were developed was to keep women's skirts out of the mud. So they would wear, they would slip these chopines over top of their other shoes and it would raise them enough because they didn't have paving back then. They had the cobblestones. They had mud and blech in the streets. So they wanted to protect their dresses. Um, so these could be up to 30 inches tall. These are pretty sane. I think you, we could say these are probably uh, 10 inches tall, maybe yeah, probably about 10 inches tall. Um, but I've seen some that are really, really, really tall. Um, so here's a couple others that are really, and I think a drawing of, um, a drawing of women and men wearing the Chopines, uh, to keep themselves out of the mud. And these are the really, really tall ones that are beautifully inlaid with mother, mother of pearl, but I personally would not want to walk in them. I could barely walk in regular shoes and bare feet, let alone 30 inches off the ground. Um, another sort of lifting us off the ground are platform shoes. Um, these were really, really popular in the 70s um, and, and, and then again in the 90s. Um, this was a bad for both women and men wore, uh, wore uh, platform shoes. Um, they were very decorative. They were very much a part of the disco era. Um, you know, if you're wearing heels or platform shoes for the first time, uh, trips and falls are pretty common. You're far from the ground. You don't have a feel for the ground because you're so far from it. Um, and it's really easy to roll a fall and hurt yourself, roll an ankle, bust a knee, whatever in these. But there was a study in the 90s whenever these sort of uh, Frankenstein shoes came back uh, in Japan that was testing uh, breaking time for uh, somebody wearing these platform shoes. And it showed that there was an appreciable difference uh, of sl uh, a slowness of reaction moving uh, a foot from the gas to the brake when they're wearing these big shoes because you don't have a sense for where the bottom of your foot is. Um, so they often led to auto accidents. Um, high heels are another sort of mechanical means that are can be considered dangerous. Um, you know, there is, other than falling over, twisting ankles, there are some skeletal muscular problems that come with constant high heel wearing. Um, these could be calluses. These could be as simple as calluses or hammer toes. Um, you could get bunions, uh, plantar fasciitis, and your neuroma. Um, heels can also, because of how your heel is lifted off the floor, um, it can shorten, constant wear can shorten and tighten your Achilles tendon. So going back to regular shoes, uh, flat shoes, or walking barefoot might be painful, might be more difficult if you wear high heels constantly. Um, and according to this podiatrist and a human movement specialist, Emmy Schwichtal, um, the increased weight on the balls of your feet causes your pelvis to tip forward. Um, she explains, to cons compensate, you lean backwards, increasing the arch in your lower back, which puts strain on your lumbar spine, hips, and knees. The higher the heels, the greater the strain. Um, so wearing high heels constantly can be, can be painful, can become painful, and can be considered dangerous. Um, this is something pretty common for, uh, for women whose job it is to wear high heels. Um, that they walk on the catwalk and they wear high heels, they turn an ankle, they hurt themselves, they sprain a knee. I saw one video of some poor, oh, poor, this poor woman. She was walking on the catwalk in heels and she just, there was something out of balance in the heels and it just, her ankles kept rolling and she could not get herself to stand upright in them just because they just were not working well for her. Oh, I, I can't watch it. It's painful to watch. Um, another element of sort of uh, dangerous high heels are these ballet boots. Um, these were first designed by Alexander McQueen. Um, and uh, what they do is they encase your entire foot. So here's your ankle here. So the heel would be in this area. And then the bottom 
like the balls of your feet and toes would be here. Um, you know, they, they don't look dangerous, but uh, I can probably assume that having your foot enclosed in something is probably not that good for movement. Um, uh, Nicki Minaj and Lady Gaga wear these a lot, but probably only for their concerts and special events. Um, so let's move on to some permanent body modifications. All the ones we just saw were kind of mechanical and could be considered temporary. Um, these are now permanent body modifications, ways that we can change ourselves that, um, that are not easily reversible. Um, often they're based on cultural or societal norms, that, uh, that it is part of a, a person's culture, so it is acceptable in the culture. Um, in our society, in, in Western society, uh, body, mods, uh, body mods are usually based in personal expression. So this becomes a highly individualized choice. Um, often these choices in Western society are a sliding scale of acceptability and they go in and out of fashion. Uh, body mar uh, often a lot of these body modifications have inherent dangers attached to them. Um, so, you know, this is some more uh, a, a culturally laden body modification. So we see uh, in this picture over here, this is from, uh, uh, this is of a woman in the Nidabeli tribe uh, in, um, in Pretoria. Um, these are uh, traditional neck rings called the Dazilla. Um, and so as women rise up in status, uh, coming of age sort of things, um, they are given the Dazilla, and as they rise in status, they get more and more and more, and these rings stretch their neck out, um, and they uh, co correlate to wealth or social ranking. Um, we also see a Mersai woman uh, wearing a lip plate as well, and this is, again, culturally laden permanent body modification. Um, another one that is culturally laden is foot biting. Um, so this foot biting originated in imperial China in the 10th or 11th century, um, probably from court dancers who had uh, smaller feet and took smaller steps. Um, so what people would do was they would take a take a, a, a piece of fabric and they would bind the foot and they would pull the toes towards the heel and the heel towards the toes. Um, and they started this at a very young age so that the shape of the foot was trained into this lotus shape. Um, foot binding became popular as a means of displaying uh, wealth and status um, because if you could afford to have your, uh, if you could afford to not work, uh, if you could afford to not do labor, you could afford to have your foot bound. So it showed off that that element of like I don't need to work in the fields, I don't need to scrub floors. So my and my foot shows that off. My bound feet showed that off. And this was adopted as a symbol of beauty in 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 older in ancient Chinese culture. Um, so the foot binding, because it was so drastic, uh, limited the mobility of women which resulted in them walking in a swaying gait with very tiny steps. Um, but there is some evidence that women worked in fields wearing, having bound feet or worked in, uh, as merchants wearing bound feet. Um, this alteration was called a lotus foot, and we're going to take a look at it in a second. Um, it was estimated in the 19th century that uh, 40 to 50 percent of all Chinese women may have had bound feet, but the upper class, the Han uh, women, had almost 100 percent of their feet bound. Um, this binding caused a permanent disability. There was no going back from it. Um, and just to warn you, uh, there are some disturbing images ahead. Um, in this and the next few uh, er, uh, pieces of slides. So I'll warn you if I can, but um, you might want to, if disturbing images um, are bothersome, you might want to look away and just listen. Um, so this is, uh, the on the left is a, a lotus foot shoe for foot binding. You'll notice how sort of tiny it is. Um, and here's a woman wearing a lotus bound foot uh, has who has a, uh, a bound foot in in the the uh, lotus shoe, and you'll notice how sort of tiny those feet are. 
Um, the next slide shows you what a bound foot looks like. Um, so this is what a bound foot looks like. And as I said, you'll notice that the toes are squished together towards the center and pulled backwards and the heel is pulled forward. Um, and so this is the um, this is a an X-ray of what the what happens to the bones, the the um, the foot bones during binding. Um, and so you notice that when whenever we walk, we walk on, you know, the whole foot generally. But for a lotus foot, you're walking just on the 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 low ball of the foot, so the 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 front ball and then a little bit behind it and on not even on the flat part of the heel, but on the back of the heel here. Um, so we're walking here and in here. Um, the next one, the next permanent modification is tattooing. Um, so, you know, tattooing again has moved in and out of fashion. Whenever I got my first, so I have tattoos. Um, whenever I got my first tattoo, it was 1992. Three, two. It was 1992. Um, in the past, nobody got tattoos. Nobody of my social circle, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins. I don't think anybody had a tattoo. And if they did, they were not showing it off. But in the 90s, tattooing became more and more acceptable. Um, and more and more people were starting to wear it, uh, have them and show them off. Um, and as we move forward to today, these sorts of modifications have become more and more, uh, more and more mainstream. That having a tattoo is not, uh, there is no, generally no bad judgments for somebody having a tattoo. Um, the only where, the only place that's kind of draws the line is like hand tattoos are a little outside of it, and face and neck tattoos are still looked at a little bit a little askance, but again, they're becoming more and more mainstream. Um, so the way tattooing works is uh, ink is uh, injected by the use of a needle uh, into the dermis, the layer below the skin, as we see in this image here. So the ink goes into this, um, uh, into the dermis. Um, early tattoos, now tattooing has been around for as long as there has been human. And a lot of these, what we're looking at, these sort of permanent modifications, uh, come with coming of age rituals. So I was 18 whenever I got my first tattoo. I was just starting college. So of course I was gonna get a tattoo. Um, often you'll see uh, these sort of rituals in, uh, in other cultures that whenever a boy or a girl comes of age, they get uh, a scar or they get a tattoo made. Um, and it becomes this rite of passage that you are now an adult or you are now on the pathway of an adult uh, of adulthood. Um, early tattoos or more um, more uh, less mechan less um, less refined means of tattooing uh, are done with stick and poke. Um, so you would take a needle and put a little ink in it and um, and just dab it into your skin. I know a lot of my my friends in high school, high school would do that sort of tattooing at home. They would put a needle in a, 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 a flame to sterilize it, I guess. And then they would poke themselves with ink to create themselves a tattoo. Um, we also have seen tattooing that is done by uh, uh, cutting the skin with a knife and then rubbing pigment into that cut um, or using a stick with a, a sharp object, a, a rock or a thorn or, um, or a needle at the very end and um, dipping that in ink and then repeatedly hitting the skin with that, uh, with that ink laden needle or sharp thing. Um, and that's jabbed into the skin. Uh, ancient tattoos, uh, like I said, usually had a ritual purpose. So you would see it in marriage or coming of age. Um, there are some gross pictures coming up. Uh, modern tattoos are really, really safe where I, I had no problems with my three tattoos um, and I don't expect I'm getting another couple tattoos in the near future. I don't expect them to be going bad. But like I said, with the personal protection equipment, you are in charge of your own safety. You need to make sure that the tattoo parlor you're getting your tattoo done is as safe as possible. Um, so you need to choose a reputable shop, uh, look at reviews, Look at uh, the pictures of tattoos 
don't look at the flash on the wall, but they better have an image book of tattoos that they've done. And you want to make sure that those tattoos look good. Um, they have to have safe practices. So the tattoo shop has to be almost uh, operating room clean. Um, you want to look for a tattoo shop where somebody on staff has a bloodborne pathogen certificate, uh, preferably the tattoo artist that is doing the work. Um, they always need to use new needles, new ink. They better be wearing damn gloves and they better have an autoclave to clean, uh, clean the equipment. Um, even although, okay, so say you have gone to the most reputable uh, tattoo artist in Green Bay. Um, even if they are safe, you are safe, everything's clean and sterile, there still be, can be some, uh, some dangers to tattooing. Um, so what if you're allergic to the ink? As uh, in this picture over here, that's what these, um, uh, uh, these blisters are. This person was allergic to the ink that was injected in their skin. Um, you could have keloid scars. That's when the, your uh, white blood cells over uh, uh, or um, the, the stuff in your, oh, I'm not a biologist. Um, that's when uh, you scar too much and it causes a keloid scar. And that's what we're looking at here. Um, it's when the body overprotects rather than just normal uh, healing, it overprotects itself from the scar. Um, and then you can get just happen to get dirty equipment. Um, so this is a tattoo rash and you can kind of tell because of um, how the, um, so what happens when your tattoo heals that the, the, as your, the layer of skin, the top layer of skin comes off, um, you'll see some flaking. Um, that's why you put cream on it to keep that flaking in, in check and antibiotic cream on it to protect yourself. Um, listen to what your tech, do not listen to me. Listen to what your tattoo artist tells you to do. Um, so this is a tattoo rash, as we can see here, probably from unsanitary practices. Um, people can still, even if they, so uh, people can be, okay, I promised I wasn't going to judge, but I'm going to judge just a little bit. Um, you have to protect yourself, but sometimes people don't and they're dumb and they have a dumb cousin who decides to go into the tattoo business and, um, they'll let your, you, you'll let, some people will let their cousin tattoo them, um, when they're drunk or high or dumb and they'll get a tattoo from people that, uh, have very little or no experience, uh, or skill or notions of safety or cleanliness. So things like kitchen scratchers, um, you could also get somebody who can't spell doing your tattoo or just plain bad taste. Again, not judging, but judging a little bit. Um, anyone can buy a tattoo machine from Amazon and start giving tattoos. Uh, if you pay $70, you can start tattooing tomorrow or whenever it would be delivered in a week. You can get it by March 2nd. Um, and that there's no training, there's no apprenticeship, there's no safety there. You don't necessarily know if somebody's giving you a tattoo in your kitchen. Oh, yeah. makes me makes me nervous. May not may make you nervous. Again, no judging, but makes me nervous. Um, so you can get in. Oh, there's bad images coming up. Uh, infection from unclean equipment. That's what we're seeing here. Is the skin is peeling off, so they've gotten an infection. Um, these little blood blisters here is probably the start of an infection and um, janky uh, needlework here. So this is probably this person's first tattoo. Um, so there is no, and this is on your body forever. Um, you can have another, a tattoo artist that doesn't really know, even though the bird is okay, but they put the tattoo too close to the, the surface of the skin and the tattoo will fade. Um, you can also get blood poisoning, you can get hepatitis, you can get HIV, you can get a staph infection, you can become very, very sick from unsanitary practices. Um, and, or you can get bad spelling, like no regrets, no regrets, sorry, no regrets, a love thicker than blood. You can have a young child do your tattoo, which seems um, not good. 
uh, rules, family, God, family, and money. Um, and then you can get in in a different language where um, that, <laughs> that they can write just about anything they want on you. Um, or you can get tattoos that are not necessarily very well done, um, like this tattoo of Harley Quinn. Um, some of the other modifications that are popular um, and could be permanent um, are things like scarification. So in scarification, they remove the upper level of skin and allow the, the scars to heal, and that causes a pattern in the skin. Um, these are silicon implants. Um, so these are other, so they just cut the skin and put this, put the implants under the dermis. Um, tattooing could cause permanent uh, changes. And then gauging, gauging is stretching the skin with a series of, uh, of larger and larger rings um, that uh, will, won't close back up because they've been stretched so much. Um, you also can see things like cybernetics. Um, so medical advances in prosthetics. So this is the when I put this together, this was the most advanced prosthetic arm to date, um, almost almost a robot arm. Uh, this is uh, Amal Grafstra's uh, implants in his hands, so there and there. Um, there is a, uh, a the idea of being a biohacker, that altering your human form with mechanicals or electricals that will change you before... Uh, that will alter you before with uh, with uh, computers and such. Um, DIY cyborgs who are upgrading their bodies with hardware without waiting for corporate development cycles or authorities to say it's okay. Um, this uh, photographer lost an eye, so he replaced it with a camera. Um, so medical advances in prosthetics, cosmetic enhancements, which we'll talk about in a little bit, a little bit more in a bit. Uh, and the idea of biohacking, of changing who you are, uh, changing your mechanical, uh, permanently changing yourself. Um, so let's move on to chemical additives. Um, so chemical additives are generally absorbed through the skin. Uh, they're activated through uh, sweat and heat. Um, and usually these are the these are things that are most hazardous to people manufacturing than there are to the wearers. Um, Dr. Campbell's safe arsenic complexion wafers, and we'll get to arsenic in a second. Um, so the first and one that was has been around probably longest is white lead. Um, white lead, we find white lead in a lot of pigment added, uh, added to pigments a lot. Um, we see this in paint um, and makeup. Um, and this allows pigments to become very even and fine and opaque. Um, it thickens up the pigment so that it has a, a thickness to it. Um, it was also used itself as makeup uh, to give the skin an even whiteness. So Queen Elizabeth uh, used, um, and other Renaissance people used this stuff called Venetian Cerise. Um, and it was a mixture, and that's this here, and that's what it looked like when it was all over your face. And um, they say Queen Elizabeth probably rubbed it on her face to hide syphilis, uh, uh, syphilis scars and syphilis sores, um, and give her that kind of white, pale white glow that is was really attractive back then. Um, so Venetian Ceruse is white lead mixed with vinegar. And one other element, I can't remember what it is, but it it allowed it to be pasted on. And this was around in Roman times. It was around um, all up until, um, you know, the 8th, 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, that this in Western culture, the standard of beauty was fine white porcelain skin. It was even worse when uh, tuberculosis was really popular because uh, the tu tuberculosis, quote unquote, tuberculosis chic was really, really popular. Um, so uh, white lead was used as makeup uh, because it gave you that fine white skin and it proved that you never went outside to work. So this is the best article in the world, Laird's Bloom of Youth, that you would just rub all over your complexion. Um, and then Henry Tetlow's famous swan down. It was harmless, white lead. Um, white lead is not harmless at all. Um, 
Lead is still in cosmetics today. Um, the FB, FDA regulates lead additives, um, and it's limited to 10 to 20 parts per million, um, and that's seen as the impurity. Uh, coal, which is a uh, black eyeliner that we see over here, and other traditional eyeliners are prohibited in the U.S. because they contain too much lead um, because of how coal is mined. Um, cosmetics like lipstick and eyeliner and stuff like that run uh, in the market run between 7 and 14 parts per million of lead. Um, but sometimes makeup is not as regulated as it should be. Um, so, and just think if you put lead on your face, lead around your eyes, lead around your eyes for decades, what that might do to you. Um, lead acetate is the color additive that is approved for use in the coloring uh, in coloring hair on the scalp and can be absorbed through the skin. So that is lead. If you dye your hair, that is lead that is absorbed through the skin. So it's lead in lipstick, lead in eyeliner, lead in um, mascara, lead in uh, foundation, and you dye your hair with lead. Um, maybe, maybe look for au naturel products. Um, some of the effects of lead, um, fatigue and anemia. Uh, weight loss, we see nausea, headache, blindness, hallucinations, depending on how much you get, uh, muscle atrophy, uh, sometimes you can have paralysis, uh, skin discoloration, hair loss, and the, the weirdest one, the most interesting one, is this thing called lead palsy, and it is one that affected people who manufactured makeup with lead a lot. Um, it was uh, a localized paralysis, so it is it affected the extensor muscles in your forearm, and it kept you from holding your wrist uh, straight out because this this muscle, the top muscle, would would atrophy, so you couldn't pull your hand back up. It would only droop. Now, if you stop using lead and stop working with lead, you'd eventually get this. Get your get your muscles would cease to atrophy. Um, and we see an image of it right here of uh, wrist drop. Um, another one, another very popular one in the 19th century is arsenic green. Um, now, arsenic was a byproduct of mining copper and lead, um, and it is super poisonous. Um, so if you've ever seen arsenic in old ladies, how the old ladies poisoned people was using arsenic. Um, in the Victorian times, it was really, really available. Um, you could go down to the chemist and buy it over the counter. It was so available. Um, and, uh, and it was in everything. Uh, the Victorians used a mix of copper and arsenic trioxide uh, for dyeing and coloring dresses. And we'll take a look at some arsenic dresses in a second. Um, wreaths, gloves, wallpaper, because it was an insecticide and a vermicide, and other decorative objects. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful green. Um, arsenic dye caused the wear to break out in sores, especially around um, very thin skin like the nail beds, um, mucous membranes around the nose, around the mouth, um, the genitals and the face. Um, and this is one of those ones that were more dangerous to the, the manufacturer, people who manufactured it and was, um, was using lead day after day after day than to the ones that just wore it every once in a while. Um, and the way that they figured out that arsenic was super duper dangerous was because of this woman, a uh, 19-year-old artificial flower maker named Matilda Schur. Um, her job was to dust flowers, like the, the greens on the, these leaves, with green arsenic-laced powder. And so she was inhaling it. She was it was getting up her nose, in her eyes. It was on her hands. It was absorbed through her fingers. Um, and she died of in 19. She died a violent and colorful death. She convulsed, uh, vomited and foamed at the mouth. Her bile was green, as were her fingernails and eye whites. Um, an average headdress. So this is a little headdress that women would wear. Um, contained enough arsenic to poison 20 people. Um, and this is uh, dresses at uh, the fashion. This one's at the Fashion Institute. Um, and I think this one is at the Victoria and Albert Museum. These are arsenic dyed dresses. 
Now, it's really interesting. I think I have this on a, another slide, but it's really interesting that, you know, we now know that arsenic is poisonous. We know that lead is poisonous. We know that mercury is poisonous. So we avoid them as much as possible. But what about the people that are curators? What about the people that are museum handlers that are dealing with these toxic, uh, could be dealing with these toxic elements day after day after day? Um, and there are now protocols about how uh, people handle mercury-laden hats and arsenic-laden dresses um, so that they themselves don't get poisoned. Um, uh, gross picture, sorry. Uh, manufacturers uh, prolonged e extreme exposure called uh, arsenic causes scoot sores. So we see that here in the nail beds. You see how the hands have turned green just from where the arsenic landed. Um, sores around the nail beds, uh, scabs, colic, diarrhea, anemia, pallor, and headaches. Um, and you'll notice that something um, something that happens with uh, with this, and we'll see this later with radium, is that whenever this arsenic poisoning and radium poisoning manifests, it manifests around um, mucous membranes. Um, and in the radium uh, in the radium case uh, of the radium girls that manifestation of sores was uh, blamed on syphilis so that these women could not get help because they were uh, they their morality was attacked um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second we'll go off the gross picture um, the arsenic walls the new dance of death uh, dedicated to the green wreath, wreath and the dress mongers uh, mercury was another amazingly dangerous uh, element and it was used in the 18th and 19th century to process fur felted hats by hatters. You'll remember from Alice in Wonderland, the mad hatter. He was mad because he was drenched in mercury. So the reason that mercury was used in hatting processes is that a lot of hats were made from fur. So rabbit, bear, and beaver fur. Now, whenever you make a hat, you want it to felt. And what felting is, is that those individual fibers of hair, we want them to mat down so that it is a solid mass and provides warmth and stability for the hat itself. Now, it's really hard for uh, rabbit fur and beaver fur and bear fur and muskrat, whatever they're using, to do that because of the structure of the hair. That each hair is sheathed in a keratin uh, casing, and that keratin is stiff. Um, and they, they used mercury to break down that keratin and allow the, the fur to become felted, to become more malleable. Um, like I said before, with the arsenic, hats processed with mercury are still really dangerous um, and are handled with care. Um, so the animal is skinned, the fur is removed and felted. Um, so that's each one of those hairs are entangled with uh, friction, pressure, moisture, chemicals, uh, mercury, and heat. Um, it is more difficult with fur like rabbit and beaver because of that stiff keratin. Now, beaver has a lot of keratin because their water, their pelts are waterproof. So they have a lot of keratin to keep water out. Um, a mixture of mercury and acid was brushed on the pelts to break down this keratin, uh, keratin in the hair. And we see this in action. Here. So this is where the keratin, this is where the mercury is. And you'll notice there's no personal protection equipment. You'll notice these vats of mercury are just right out in the air. Um, so not only were hatters themselves uh, affected with mercury, but mercury vaporizes in the air. Um, they were poisoned, uh, but the land in neighborhoods uh, on the factories were poisoned because it, it mercury releases into the air and it gets into the dirt. It gets into just about everything. Um, uh, clouds of mercury vapor were released into the environment in uh, 1829 in Paris. 40,000 inhabitants around a hat factory contracted Pink's disease. So we see that here, what Pink's disease is. Um, that's when you absorb mercury into your skin and it, you break out in these pink dots. Um, mercury can be easily absorbed and to a lesser extent by the skin or stomach. Uh, and mercury never goes away. Once you have mercury in your system, you are, uh, you are, can, you will always have mercury in your system. 
Um, so mercury causes convulsions, trembles, paralysis, um, psychological problems like uh, shyness or paranoia, paranoia, as well as photosensitivity, cardiorespiratory problems, and tooth loss. Um, and so this is a hat factory in Danbury that we see here. Uh, another dangerous element that was used in a lot of things was radium. Um, this is in the form of radium chloride, was discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie in 1898. Uh, in the 20th century, it was added to a lot of things like uh, inks, paints, dyes to make things glow in the, glow in the dark. It was even used in glassware. Um, it was used as a tonic. It was used as a, uh, a health, uh, a, 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 an element to promote health. Uh, radium suppositories, radium water, um, radium ink. This was uh, printed with radium ink, so it glowed in the dark. We didn't, they didn't know at the time that it was super <laughs> dangerous. They knew quickly later, though, that it was. Um, so we had this, this time in, um, in World War One, um, that uh, this company um, hired women to paint watch faces. Um, and these type of watches were really, really popular in World War One because they you could see the time without it glowing, without it throwing off a lot of light. So you weren't in danger of being seen by the enemy because it's just a little bit that glows, not the whole night. Um, they were instructed, these women were instructed to point their brushes. For those of you who aren't painters, um, what you do is you take your paintbrush, a little fine paintbrush, and you stick it in your mouth and you get it coated in saliva. And that causes the paint, the bristles of the brush to come down to a really fine point. And then you can use that point to paint tiny little lines like this or uh, numbers on the dial. Um, the women didn't know it was dangerous. Um, the people who ran the factory, the men who ran the factory, knew it was dangerous. Um, whenever anybody came to the factory, they stood behind lead shields to observe the workers, wore lead vests. So they knew it was dangerous. They were not telling these women that it was dangerous because that is not cost effective. Um, because of the true nature that was hidden from these women, um, they would play games with radium like paint their teeth or their nails or their faces and glow in the dark. And then they got cancer. They got severe cancer and they uh, became very sick and their bodies fell apart around them. Um, to get out of it, the, the lawyers for the company tried to claim that these women had syphilis. That's why they were, they were rotting from the inside out. It could not have been the very dangerous radium that they were told to put in their mouths. Oh no. Ah, uh, oh. uh, radium was once added to products such as toothpaste, hair, creams, uh, even food like coffee because it was a cure curative because of its curative powers. Um, as we see some of the uh, uh, advertisements here. Um, we also have things like nitrobenzene and aniline dyes. Um, nitrobenzene was used, uh, used to be a major component in shoe polish, uh, and many dyes and paints used aniline dyes as a medium. Uh, aniline dyes come from coal tar, um, and they are carcinogenic, um, and they could be absorbed because they were a powdered substance. They could be absorbed through the skin or uh, inhaled, um, and they have links to bladder cancer. Uh, aniline dyes were used in a uh, scene painting, theatrical scenic painting, for a very, very long time. I actually have worked in paint shops where aniline dyes exist, uh, existed. Um, and there's a lot of uh, leukemia out there and cancer out there because of, uh, and that can be linked to aniline dyes and the heavy use of aniline dyes. We didn't think it was dangerous. Um, another chemical that was used for, uh, for humans uh, was belladonna eye drops. And this was really popular during the Renaissance and Roman times. So what women would do is they would make a tincture of belladonna, uh, diluted belladonna with water or wine, and they would drop them in their eyes. Um, and that would cause their pupils to dilate because uh, belladonna is a muscle relaxant. And it, uh, uh, it 
cause women to be seen as more sexually available or sexually aroused. Um, it often caused a quickening of the pulse, uh, confusion, seizures. If you did it wrong and if you're doing it in your house, you have a chance of doing it wrong. Uh, hallucinations and even death if you can uh, if you can see it and you can kind of see down here in this painting uh, what it does so the pupils are a little more dilated in those two um, deadly nightshade belladonna is still used in medicines today so things like sleeping pills eye drops um, it's also used as a pre-surgery muscle relaxant so it so you don't move around so much uh, and asthma drugs because it relaxes the avuli in your lungs uh, Botox is another one. Now, Botox, again, is something that was a little, whenever it first came out a bunch of years ago, it was seen as oh, botulism in my face. No. And um, there was a lot of things that went wrong with it. But eventually, uh, it has gotten better and people have calmed down a bunch. Um, so this was based off of the botulism toxin. Um, this is the most lethal toxin uh, known. Um, so it comes from uh, canning gone wrong. So the botulism thrives if you if you're doing home canning or you're uh, it's the post apocalypse and you're looking for food. Don't ever try to eat a, a tin can that has gone out of shape that is moldy or bubbly because it's bubbling because of botulism. Um, so what happens with Botox? It is injected under the skin and it relaxes and paralyzes the muscles in certain mus muscle areas and it reduced the appearance of wrinkles. So forehead wrinkles around the eyes, between the eyes. Um, they don't do it really much around the mouth because you need those to smile and talk. Um, but when, uh, when um, Botox first came out, there was sometimes that it was done badly. There was human error that was injected in the wrong place. Um, and if you use too much, it could spread beyond the inf injected areas and kind of freeze your face. Um, there was a lot of jokes at the time, but today botch, uh, botulism, today Botox is pretty safe, uh, as long as you go to a reputable trained person. Um, other chemical, chemical toxins found in clothing and cosmetics, uh, coal tar is one. Um, this is a dark liquid byproduct of the production of coke and coal gas from coal. Um, you use it to treat dandruff and psoriasis. Um, Cold tar is also, if you've ever seen Mary Poppins and love the dancing chimney sweeps, um, they could get cancer from coal tar because that's what's, that's creosote that's up in your chimney and that's what they were sweeping out. Um, so they called it uh, the, one of the first known substances to give cancer. Um, it's called chimney sweeps carcinoma. Uh, some of the other toxins that end up in our clothing are um, beryllium, thallium, um, cadmium and cholium, um, which are uh, used a lot in, um, in leather processing. So again, these elements are dangerous to the manufacturers, um, usually, usually, in, um, uh, usually in Asian countries or South American countries, uh, Asian countries like Bangladesh, India, um, uh, Indonesia, the ones that might not have as strict uh, manufacturing laws. So they're released into the environment, they're dumped into the water, and towns are poisoned by these, these um, toxins. One of the ways to combat this is always to know where your clothing is coming from. Um, other hazards, um, some of the other weirder hazards is large clothing. Um, so in the 19th century, uh, large hoops, skirts that were really, really popular. Uh, crinolines, which is like um, a netting that's underneath skirts. Um, they made large round skirts popular. Um, these skirts could stand out from the body about three feet around. Um, and sometimes they were hard to control. Um, so some less deadly mishaps were getting skirts caught in carriages uh, dragging them through the mud, and at this time there was not a lot of sanitation, so you were dragging them through every uh, spit and poop and pee and whatever food, yuck, whatever you could. Um, they could blow up in windy cities, they could get your skirt under and just go up over your head, or uh, sitting down and rising, the skirt could flip up and show off your, your bloomers. Um, I, I think Carol Burnett has a 
uh, has a skit about the the big hoop skirt. Her Scarlett O'Hara has a big hoop skirt that she sat down and it went up. Um, not much more than embarrassing or gross, um, but fires and crinolines were a deadly, deadly combination. Um, so a lot of crinolines were made of horsehair or linen, which is a very dry product. Um, and because of their size, they were really hard to keep track of where they were, as we see in this drawing. Um, this is a another kind of jokey drawing, but you could get three feet across from there and not know where your skirts were dragging. Um, so up to 40,000 women, they think, were killed with when their crinolines caught fire. Um, some of the most famous people, um, so Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's wife, um, died of burns after her dress caught fire from a, um, a fallen candle. And Oscar Wilde's two half-sisters died, died when their skirts caught fire. They were attending a ball, and the back of one of the girls' dresses caught fire from touching the fireplace. So it was absolutely a danger. Um, one of the worst ones was in the Continental Theater in Philadelphia. Um, the theater burned to the ground, and uh, nine ballerinas died when their skirt caught uh, brushed up against um, uh, gas flames. And that's how theaters were lit by gas lamps um, at the time. And so one of the ballerinas touched the gas lamp and just set the whole theater on fire. Um, large skirts were also dangerous in uh, other spheres. Um, Pre-19th century large skirts were regaled to the regulated to the nobility. Um, they were worn by women who did not do much, if any, physical labor. Um, but, you know, at this time, a lot of fashion was trickled down. So, uh, so wealthy people would wear skirts, then eventually it would move through the upper crust into the middle class and down into the working class. And the working class wanted to be upwardly mobile. So they would um, mimic the clothing worn by people who could, uh, who were safe quote unquote, safe to wear it. Um, so the lower classes, the working class, would wear these hoop skirts uh, and crinolines. And this could cause problems for women working in factories. There's a story of one um, of women going into a textile mill. And a textile mill, whenever you're spinning and weaving, that's a lot of turning material and you don't want any loose fabric because it could get caught and pull you into the machinery that this uh, factory owner would force his women's workers to take off their hoop skirts, take off their crinolines, leave them at the door, go into work, and they would get them back at the end of the day to remove some of that hazard. Um, and sometimes it could be socially perilous, like getting yelled at, hey, you look dumb in that, my servant looks, my maid servant looks dumb in this uh, crinoline, take it off. And of course, the, the lady of the house looks just as dumb. Um, another type of uh, sort of perilous clothing was the hobble skirt. Um, this was very popular uh, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century during the Edwardian area. Uh, it appeared around 1910. Uh, as we see, a hobble skirt kind of tightens down around your knees, and uh, women could not take long steps. They had to take very small mincing steps. Um, this was designed by um, Paul Pruro, um, or Pruyette, uh, who, ironically, uh, he got rid of corsets and bustles. I He says, I freed women from corsets and then tied their ankles together. Um, so, you know, if you can't run, you can't step on a train, you can't get down off of a, uh, a carriage. Um, it is a dangerous, tying your ankles together is a dangerous, uh, a dangerous uh, proposition. Sorry. Uh, danger of tripping was perceived. Um, but it was more of a moral danger than a physical one. And this is something that is pretty common in the history of clothing, is that whenever people wear clothing that is risque, so for example, a hobble skirt that shows off your, your, the shape of your legs, it is dangerous. If women want to run for a governor, they ought to be able to run for a car. If they want to be legally free, they shouldn't be sartorially shackled. But with the lack of logic that the sex can be counted on to display, they have chosen a trammeled figure and shackled anchors, ankles when they need most to have them free in the strenuous race for equality with the trousered sex. Yuck. Um, 
so women are their their choices their clothing choices are calling into question their intelligence huh. um sometimes you also have modernly socially dangerous like the hobble skirt uh socially dangerous clothing um the mini skirt was a socially dangerous clothing uh the bikini um, uh, laws that keep women make force women to wear sh tops whenever men can go topless um, things like baggy jeans or really tight hipster pants um, all of these are not dangerous for the wearer but they are seen as dangerous for the morals of a society which is you know a one way to try and control youth culture um, some more, some little little uh, end bits. We're getting towards the end here. Thanks for sticking with. Uh, X-ray hair removal. Sometimes people would sit in front of an X-ray machine for up to 30 hours to make their hair fall out. That doesn't seem like a good idea at all. Uh, so vermin uh, that inhabits clothing. So body lice spreading disease, um, especially in the military pre-World War II. Um, this would often, uh, uh, body lice would cause typhus and typhoid fever. Uh, also used, this could also be used in germ warfare, and we've seen that throughout the ages. Um, long skirts, like I said before, drag through disgusting streets into the home. Um, even today, they think that diseases can lurk in scrubs and lab coats, so they're looking at um, antibiotic-resistant strains of MRSA and staph that they might be spread through scrubs and lab coats and even staff this way. Um, and this is a flannelette, um, the, a piece of, a type of cotton that is super flammable. So we see flannelette that is in 60 seconds, it is gone because they caught it on fire. Um, and this caused death from uh, people being burned to death because they were wearing flannelette. Um, tanning beds and the rise of skin cancer, that some skin cancer can be seen to people not wanting to be in the sun, but still wanting to be tanned. So they lay in tanning beds, which ends up giving them cancer, skin cancer as well. Um, some, uh, this is the triangle shirtwaist pot fire. So it's clothing that is dangerous again to the manufacturer. Um, this is a, uh, a the, a shirtwaist is a kind of blouse at the, the turn of the century. And uh, what happened in the shirtwaist fire is that um, the the owners of the company barred the doors so that the women wouldn't go out and meet their boyfriends or their husbands. They had to stay in the building throughout their shift. Um, and they had also disabled some of the emergency exits. Um, so whenever the factory caught fire, um, there were bottlenecks at doors and women had to leap from windows uh, to escape the fire and uh, 150 women perish uh, in the factory fire um, and it was pretty horrible. Um, a lot of sort of the labor unions came from stuff like this that the companies didn't care uh, what happened to their workers uh, because workers were seen as cheap and plentiful. Um, we also see this at the Rana Plaza collapse in a manufacturing clothing manufacturer in Bangladesh in uh, 2012, I think, um, that uh, a very a lot of people died because the the building collapsed around the manufacturing um, because the business owners just it wasn't important for them. Uh, brown lung, another disease caused by manufacturing clothing. Um, that the small particulates, just kind of like uh, black lung for coal mines, uh, the small particulate particulates would get in the lungs and cause lung cancer. And I found this interesting. These are celluloid combs that exploded if they got too hot. Fascinating. Um, and these are my favorite. This is our final slide. So thank you for sticking with me. Hopefully you got a, a good glimpse of the history of dangerous and dangerous clothing. Um, so this is my favorite. This is the Incroyable and the Merveux. Um, so this was a youth movement uh, after the French Revolution. Um, just imagine that you have seen a whole lot of people just die. And you are a child. You are a young person who lived through that. So you want to thumb your nose at the, at the revolution and you want to 
grasp anything you can. So uh, the uh, neoclassicism was really popular at this time. So as we see here, women are dressing like Greek urns, um, like a Greek statues. So they would wear very thin clinging cotton. Uh, sometimes uh, it was see-through as we see through here. Um, and sometimes they would even drench themselves to make the cotton cling closer. Um, they would also, also, also really popular were these, um, these uh, neck uh, ribbons of red to mimic the guillotine cut. Um, and even men uh, were taken with large collars, enormous lapels, and their pants and boots painted on. Um, so even in the past, we sometimes act beyond our own self-interest. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this talk on beauty and death. Uh, please contact me if you have any questions. Take care.